excited to have you here. And I know, oh, great. We've got a face down there. Krista's face. Krista, can we hear your voice? Can you click on and say, hey, the microphone in the bottom left corner of your screen. Hey. Hello. Hey, great. Welcome. And you can mute it up again. Um, so we're in our hopeful world. We are hoping that um, we actually are able to have the, a smaller group like this for these meetings because although maybe you're like, oh no, I don't want my face. It's late at night. It's the end of the day. I really do think that this makes us feel more like a community of people that are hanging out and um, informally talking about something that's important. So we want to welcome you. The three folks, well, I guess it's the three on the top of my screen. It may be different depending on the order, but wave if you're Jenna, Kristen, Devardi, and I um, want to welcome you all to the very first Teach Climate Network Book Club meeting. Um, and we're super excited to be kicking off this this year after, I would say, many years of different people asking for this. Um, and so, um, we're hopeful that you get something out of this and um, and get questions answered and maybe come back next month or maybe you're busy next month and come back another. We're going to be here and, and working on this all year. Um, I think to start off, uh, we'd like to just do a quick introductions. And since um, there's a f so few of us, maybe we can all, um, each of us introduce ourselves and we'll start with Jana in the upper left hand corner and, and and move on and so when it's your turn when we say your name if you could unmute your microphone but otherwise remain muted hello everyone um, i'm jenna tots not megan van lo uh, and i'm the education coordinator here at climate generation so i work with our k-12 um, program and work with teachers and students um, I, I'm next in my window. So um, I'm Kristen Poppleton. I'm the director of education at Climate Generation, and we'll tell you a little bit more about us in a second. But I'm, like I said, really excited to have you all here today. Hi, I am Devardi. I am a K-16 STEM education fellow at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I am very excited to have this group and start reading for fun and for the topic that I really like to read about. So we'll talk to you guys more in a bit. Great, Katie? Am I good? Yeah, I have the power okay. to unmute people. So if you guys want me to do it, I can do that. All right, I'm Katie and I came to the Institute over the summer at the University of Minnesota and I teach seventh grade science. And I have kids that are very interested in the hurricanes that we're receiving. So they're always pumping me for information, but I'm not to my ecology unit yet. So excited to see what we're gonna learn. That means it's my turn. Um, I'm Sarah Niemeyer. I teach um, seventh and eighth grade science at Wabasha Kellogg, and then I'm teaching my first high school course this year, and it's actually using three of the curriculum guides through the Institute. So um, some most eager stuff that I'm trying this semester, and so far going really well, and liking what I'm teaching, and the kids are liking it. So yeah. Great. Now? So my name is Cal Manis. I am a recently retired high school science teacher. Um, I was the science department. I work in rural communities up in northeastern Arizona. And I now run a, a research grant through Arizona State University studying rural STEM identity. And I have apparently fallen into being the STEM go-to person in a lot of these outlying communities. So I saw the information on this from a NOAA um, climate stewards. I believe that's where I saw it from NOAA climate stewards and thought it sounded very interesting. Okay, welcome. Uh, Betsy? Mm, sorry. 
I had muted at the same time. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, so Cal, I'm from Arizona too, except the other university, <laughs> University of Arizona in Tucson. And um, yeah, I teach teachers. So we run um, professional development for teachers through Arizona Project Lat. And um, we are doing a big environmental literacy grant with teachers. So I'm hoping to get some material to share with them and then as Devardi said, read about stuff I like to read about. Oh, plus, I did Climate Gen Education Ambassadors last year. Thank you. Krista? Aloha. Uh, Aloha. My name is Krista. I live in Hawaii. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon for me. Um, I saw this from uh, uh, the NOAA Climate Stewards webinar on Monday. I'm the Sustainability Curriculum Coordinator for the University of Hawaii 10 Campus System, and I'm an English professor. So in spring, I'm teaching a environmental literature course using climate fiction. I'm like a maniacal reader of cli-fi and super interested in these types of conversations. Oh, and I also have a middle school child, so I'm really interested in in what like you seventh, six, seven, eighth grade teachers teach as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Nancy doesn't have, doesn't have uh, yeah microphone, but. And I, I asked her to write out her intro, but mm -hmm. I actually can introduce Nancy. <laughs> Nancy teaches in um, Chicago, Illinois. She, last I heard, I haven't talked to her for a little while, probably a year, but oh, she's a mysterious high school teacher, she says. <laughs> Maybe I won't reveal any more about it. But <laughs> she, she, um, she works in the city and she's got some, uh, uh, she was tasked with actually teaching climate change right before the year started last year. So. I'm not sure how it ended up in the end last year, but we're excited to have her back. So um, it's all the same, she says. So anyways, we're excited to have Nancy back as well. And then we have a phone call in listener who um, I assume can't speak. Um, so welcome, I hope you hear something from this and maybe next uh, month you'll be able to hop on the actual webinar format as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, I think that today's meeting is going to be probably a little bit um, more formal or less than um, than the future ones because we didn't start with an actual book that we were reading this time and we just kind of threw a bunch of things at you. Um, so what our plan was is to kind of go through talking a little bit about um, the extreme weather events and resources we outlined. Um, and then we have a couple books that we have, we had a couple suggestions from other folks, but that we have a poll set up for to um, ask you all to vote on, on maybe what, what to read next month. And I will say that um, our first selections are probably more in the um, K, they're not as much in the adult range, they're more in the YA range, but there are a lot of great adult ones too, and I'm, we're open to anything. This is, um, we're hoping this is like fun. This isn't really super formal per se, but you all bring your own ideas and questions and suggestions um, when, when you have time to meet with us. And we'll see how it pans out throughout the year, how many people are able to join us. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen if I can remember how to do it. Um, and there it is, share screen. Um, talk through a couple different slides that help kind of guide our conversation. Um, Devardi, I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more just about why ne University of Nebraska-Lincoln is a part of this um, cooperation, but I think it's interesting, so go well, for it. Well, we're starting here? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, Nebraska just passed their new science standards. We are not aligning to NGSS, but we are coming as close as we can uh, to, the, to the next generation science standards. And so we had recently uh, a, a vote uh, six to one uh, where uh, the new standards were accepted and so we can teach climate change 
as a part of the uh, new, as a part of all this. Uh, coincidentally, the STEM uh, science literacy group of univers from University of Nebraska Lincoln, which I am a part of, uh, and just as a side note, I have moved from Minnesota to Nebraska post uh, my doctoral. So this is new to me, the people, the, the community here. So coincidentally, we also have a new grant along with the, uh, Kristen is also a, an advisory board member on our grant. We have a climate literacy grant focused on high school teachers. So now we were really hoping for these standards to pass and they have passed. But when I read the language that has come out, there are, there's a few very fine interplay of words that to me um, is very interesting. It will, it, I think, and I told Kristen and Jenna that I hope I'm completely wrong. I think in the classroom it's gonna play out as a debate, uh, questioning the models rather than, it, it's gonna play out as students questioning whether the models or the global climate models are correct or not. So, so it's interesting, we will see, well, educators love challenges, and so this is one of those cases. But anyway, I was just uh, interested in, let's just start to read something that our uh, you know, middle schoolers and high schoolers are reading. And let's just say, see what's out there and just have informal conversations with a group of like-minded people. So. That's where the Nebraska of Lincoln, our big red logo is right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we're excited to work with um, Devardi because um, we've been partnering on things for a long time and she's, it's fun to work across and not just within organizations. So we're excited to have her, uh, the three of us working together this year. Um, a little bit just about who we are, Climate Generation. We're an organization based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. A few of you had mentioned an institute. For those of you that don't know what the heck they're talking about, um, one of the things that we do is offer professional development for, um, for educators, for non-formal educators. Um, we do public engagement um, and we work with youth. And, and so there may be attendees to our institute. Um, we have also, um, done some mentoring through education ambassadors over the years um, as well, and that's what Betsy was referencing. Um, and so um, this is just an initiative that we have to really extend and sustain our connections with um, the teachers that we already do work with, as well as connect with new ones um, throughout the year, um, and also motivate us to read, read throughout the year too, new things. So. Um, Using Zoom, um, we've already kind of broken some of the rules. We are trying to figure out what's going to be the best way for us to use this. I think um, ideally our group will always be um, not huge. Um, we have, you know, a number of people signed up, but we realize people will come and go throughout, throughout the year. Um, but just being respectful and, um, un or, you know, raising your hand at this point might be fine if you're going to unmute, but we're a small group, so. I don't think, I hope we have to actually institute rules because there's so many people on, I guess, but I, I prefer it smaller anyways. Um, guidelines of this group, first and foremost, we established this group for you. So what ideas do you have? What questions do you have? What feedback do you have? Um, we're trying to create a network here of, of people that can support each other. And if you have like a burning question, um, about something you're working on where you're teaching, um, send it to us before the webinar or if we're on the webinar, ask it. And, and we have, at this point, just today, 10 people here that might have some ideas and help for you. Um, feel no guilt, that's rule number two. Um, you don't have to prepare to come, but if you do come, please participate. So um, it's okay if you don't read, it, but you're still interested in hearing what people thought of a book, if that's what's going to be useful to you, great. Um, but please be um, plan to participate in some way. Um, of course, be respectful of each other's ideas, opinions, and also their time. Um, try not to spend a long, long time on a comment. Be succinct as possible. Um, we'd love for you to spread the word, invite your colleagues to join us. 
Um, we're going to be trying to be consistently meeting every third Wednesday unless it falls on a holiday or something. Um, and we are asking, and Jenna will bring this up at the end, um, for volunteer bloggers each month. One person who is interested in reflecting on the book that we read and maybe how you used it or what you thought of it. And then we'll be um, sharing that um, in our, um, on our website. We'll post it and we'll elevate it, kind of share it through social media and stuff too. So it's an opportunity to be famous if, if you're interested, famous in our little tiny world. <laughs> Um, so with that, we asked you a little bit to introduce yourself, but um, we had a couple questions. Um, the first thing we wanted to ask was just for you to, in the chat window, if you could share one word that describes why you came here today. I know it's hard, but just one. And while you are doing that, or after you've done that, um, I'm gonna launch a poll. Um, and so just a couple of really easy questions. One, to let us practice the poll, um, and then two, just to ask a couple of questions. And, and you filled this out when you signed up, but um, here we go. So what type of educator are you, and then where do you live? Is the poll still up there? Or mm -hmm. is it missing? Okay. It There's behind. a note at the bottom that says host and panelists can't vote. Come on. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, there's a, a note. When we make people panelists, they can't vote in polls. <laughs> All right, you guys just helped us with the first one. Then you the poll. <laughs> oh, geez, we have to figure this out. This is our Zoom, our Zoom research our hours of research did not bring in that particular. But there you go, there you go, Betsy, for the win. Yeah, for the win, and Betsy. Yeah. What type of educator and what region are you from? We took those regions yeah. from the National Climate Assessment Report. If you haven't looked at the National Climate Assessment Report, I would highly suggest it. Great place to find graphs and data about what's happening with climate change in the US. Let me know when everyone's done because it's in that place now where I can't see anything because I is everyone answered. Kristen, can you yes. see the chat? No, I'm doing all this full screen stuff and you know, but that's if fine. You, if you do have a word of why you came here today, we would really love that. We're big on wordles around here. Um, so it's a great thing for us to collect and then um, use for social media and such. So there's there a go. word that describes why you came here. If you can throw that in the chat bar, that would be awesome. So you can continue. Oh, I love that. Oceana. Yeah. yeah, great. All right, well, I'm gonna move on to um, talking just a little bit about um, context and um, teachable moments and it's sometimes sobering teachable moments. And so um, you all read that this first session, we thought um, it would be who of us to talk just a little bit about extreme weather. And um, I think this filters actually in a little bit into the Cli-Fi books that we've, um, a few of the Cli-Fi books that we have chosen later too. Um, but obviously um, the weather that we have seen, the hurricanes, of the last, um, you don't see my shared screen? No? no. What, what do you see? Blank, black. Oh, we resume there share. Go. Perfect. Okay, great, sorry. The extreme weather of um, the last month has been something that has um, caught the attention of the country, um, including students that are in classrooms. We see this, and how do we respond as teachers? Um, 
And one of the things um, that our organization really believes and I think is really truly a tenant of climate change education in general is that um, the context of climate is actually really critical. Um, and when we avoid talking about climate change, we're doing a major disservice on many levels. Um, we know that we all come from different regions of the country. We come from um, different challenges in our classrooms, but um, the Hurricane Harvey, as this you know, quote from one of the readings, uh, readings that we shared um, says, is really the latest illustration of how our cities are not prepared for climate change. So if we're not really talking about this context um, of climate change, then why even be prepared for such events? Um, and these are um, sobering, I think, and they can be scary, but they can also really, I think, elevate the issue and also inspire us to think about, well, what does this mean um, for us as students and what does it mean for the cities we live in and how do we prepare for things like this? Um, one of the resources that we shared was just these visualizations that put, are put out by Climate Central, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen other visualizations of taking very complex data, taking you know graphs and, and visuals and turning it into something that's like very clear. Um, I know some of you work in high school, some of you work at a college level, some of you are more at an elementary level. And so um, how we use these may be different, I think, but one of the things that I always really appreciate is looking at things like this and offering it as an example of how can we bring data to life? How can we make data more understandable? Um, and when you're working with students that are older, that's a great challenge with, for them. When you're working with students that are younger, this is a great starting point for entering into it. So we love what Climate Central does with, with their different, um, different things. And I thought this was a really great example of, of thinking about these hurricanes and what we actually know um, and it's pretty basic. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff. We know that if there's warmer water, there's more energy in the atmosphere um, and which can lead to this heavier rain and these higher storm surges. And I don't know if anyone um, watched the video that we had linked to just about chocolate chip cookies. There's other videos about um, one of the ones that Jenna always loves to use is about a baseball on um, baseball player on steroids, but just making it very clear that yes, these storms would be happening, but um, this added energy that we have in our atmosphere from it being warmer um, is, is, is creating these conditions for this much heavier um, rainfalls and these more damaging sorts of storms. Um, the activity, one of the, so we sent you a list of activities from um, the clean collection. Has anyone, um, Let's see, give a, is there emojis in the, in the chat box? I don't think there's emojis. I'm like, give a thumbs up. Give a thumbs up on this screen if you've heard of the clean collection before. So a couple of you, double thumbs up from Jenna. So the clean collection, if you link to that, otherwise you can go back in your email and is a, a extremely vetted collection of educational resources um, that focus specifically on climate change. Um, a few of our lessons are, are in there from Climate Generations Curriculum Collection. Thank you, Jenna, she put it up there. Um, but one of the great things you can do is search for particular things. And I, I think I searched for extreme weather and it just brought up all the resources that um, were focused on extreme weather. And, um, and this is one in particular that I really um, enjoyed when I um, was poking through it. And Integrate is, a, I mean, Cirque, who created this, does some great stuff. Um, but what I liked about it is that it was very interdisciplinary. And that's, I think, one of the ways that I think we need to always be teaching about this issue, understanding the social, the economic, the political implications as well. And it's about answering this question of what, to what extent should we build or rebuild coastal communities? And I think that that question in and of itself is very, um, can be very non-controversial. Like it's a great starting point to start looking at um, the data that we have and that we um, can, can look at over time. And the activity connects you with some of that data. And so you have some great worksheets if you like worksheets. 
Um, but you kind of build through um, developing a claim, develop, gathering the evidence, and, and doing some reasoning for those of you that are using CER in your classroom um, to really think about what does this look like and, and is there a need to actually rebuild coastal communities and then and what should we do about it? So it's one of the ones that I thought was great because it gets more into this more um, looking at data, but then doing something with it and, and thinking about what we can do about it and being constructive. So that was one of the activities that I pulled out from it. Um, at this point, I wanted to ask if anyone else had looked at some of them, um, the readings that we said, and what was your favorite one and, and why? Um, or was there an activity that you had kind of looked at and said, ooh, this could work in my classroom? Can unmute yourself. Or is there any, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, we're gonna be good teachers and give you a lot of wait time here. No, I try it. I, <laughs> I counted to like five. <laughs> or is there questions or concerns? Like when you think about doing this in your classroom, honestly, just throw them out here. This is a safe space. I honestly didn't have time to go through any of the links totally that you had posted. I love like looking at them and seeing what information was there, but. We have conferences this week, so I've been getting ready for that. It's so <laughs> great. This is the no no guilt <laughs> club. So no guilt. Have you, um, I mean, has anyone used, you know, there's two things here. Has anyone used like teach these teachable moments in their classroom in successfully? Like where there's something that happens and like, oh, I'm gonna use this now to bring this in. So I'm gonna jump in here. While the Minamina phenomena is getting bigger and bigger in NGSS. So many of these events can be uh, used as phenomena to establish a phenomena-based uh, uh, lesson sequence or storyline to involve students in that investigation. And so um, these days, this fall, that is, the, that is pretty much what I'm doing, going over these articles, um, recent and past, looking, matching data and trying to come up with a storyline based on a phenomena. And one of the most challenging things that I am experiencing is how to make that phenomena small, because these are in big, vast issues. And so how to make it small, um, investigate in phenomena that can be investigated in a series of lessons is like a very challenging thing for me. I agree. I mean, that is like breaking these into bite sized pieces is part of the challenge. Will you share what you learn? <laughs> Will you tell us all the things you learned? <laughs> Well, that's why I joined this community and, and now we have a safe space to to share our experiences. So as I go with it, I will and I will actually brainstorm with you guys like, OK, so this is what I think. And I have you guys to to who are all the way from I see elementary to high school. So I think I am really happy with the group we have. <laughs> so, yes, I will share. Awesome. Well, I'll just add, can you guys hear me? Yeah, oh. I'll just add that um, one of the things that I heard on at Monday's webinar from the, with the NOAA climate stewards, this was a synthesis of like research data on teaching climate change. And in response to um, what you had said about students drawing conclusions about the models, I saw kind of a contradiction because the research says um, that it's really good to give students data and let them draw conclusions from the data. But I also see this contradiction with a lot of teachers who just are frustrated with trying to remain objective and they want to say, you know, hey, this is a thing. 
no, it's not a debate. Um, so that's just something I'm kind of thinking about is how do you use data and let students um, draw their own conclusions while at the same time um, not feeling like we have to stay totally objective and entertain two sides of a debate that doesn't exist in science. I think um, for that, one of the things is like Devardi said is when you're, when you're providing data or having students look for data is you make it manageable for them. So, you know, if you're showing like visualizations of certain things, you know, they can, it, it doesn't seem like they have to, the claims evidence reasoning, you know, what are they claiming based on the evidence? What's their reasoning? So it's not like, you know, with a lot of the evidence, they can come up with something totally out of the blue unless they start doing cherry picking or things like that. So maybe, you know, having them, it's, I think it's still very important for them to be able to do that, to, to do the do claims that. evidence reasoning and look at the data. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. One of the things that I found out when I was teaching this, and I live kind of out in the middle of nowhere, um, I brought some ranchers in to talk to my students about this. And instead of me just presenting data and having them work through it, I wanted to bring people in that it affected their livelihood and to show that there was real relevance in it. It, it took some of my students who were, and I, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but who, who thought, who think that Fox News is real news, who took them from that mindset to a, the beginning of a different one. So I found that to be extremely helpful. Yeah, I would, I mean, I would agree with that multi-layered approach of data and stories. I mean, that's really, from our public engagement perspective, how we engage with people in communities for sure. But I do think that it is a, a way for students also to, um, to make the data more relevant, is think of their own stories or their family stories or the things. I mean, this is going back, of course, to the hurricane itself, but that's one thing. Jenna, were you gonna, um, should we move on to the next or no? Um, any, does anyone else have um, anything to add to that? I was going to add something like one of our teachers that we are working with right now, um, his kids do a lot with social justice and so, he he says you know he he brought up the whole idea of environmental racism which i'd never heard before but he talked about his students you know from the lower socioeconomic group are really experiencing climate change you know even in tucson with you know because their air they don't have air conditioning or their air conditioning is not working things like that so you know with the lower socioeconomic group within our country right now, a lot of them are experiencing climate change that people that are more affluent don't have to experience. Well, I was just gonna say that I think when I plan on pulling this unit in with my ecology standards, that I want my students to interview their elders, you know, grandparents or guardians, just to talk about, I mean, my parents always talk about the 1978 blizzard and how that was just, just an insane amount of snow. And I mean, and that we haven't seen that, you know, the kids really don't know what that is, um, but so they can get insight from older generations about whether, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And I think that's a great thing too, once again, to like take the stories and then actually look at the data too, to see where memories and, 
and um, data sort of intersect too. And those are really actually easy things to do. Um, uh, I think I have an activity like that somewhere too. I can't remember, but well, should we pop ahead to the next part? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great. So um, as we we're coming down to the last 15 minutes, top of the hour, and we want to make sure that we get into the cli-fi. So hopefully just this little discussion to kick things off was useful. Um, and Jenna is going to start us off with Jon Snow and <laughs> cli-fi. <laughs> uh, this came from an article, um, Climate fiction can books save the planet and that's why Jon Snow is in there there's some reference to Game of Thrones and the climate change connections um, but just climate fi or cli-fi cli climate fiction um, just a little bit of background and kind of some some themes and things um, it's really a sub genre of science fiction um, but with the theme of these stories being about our place, our earth, not somewhere far off and away, um, examining the impact of pollution and climate change, rising sea level um, on human civilization. So it's not about a different species or somewhere that's far away. And it's really making environmental issues uh, more accessible to young readers. Um, but there's also, it's not just young adult uh, fiction, climate fiction, there's, there's adult fiction as well. Um, and we're able to connect climate change to more than just the science classroom. Um, in the past, um, and to a lot of people, climate change is taught in a science classroom. And this gives the, a good way to teach it in an English language arts classroom. Um, and we'll talk about connections to social studies. Um, and we do a lot even uh, with art. Um, so there's, there's ability to connect cli-fi and to teach cli-fi and climate change in almost any subject area. And so it's always really fun for us to get that challenge of, okay, how do we incorporate it into this type of classroom? So we're gonna go through four different books really quickly, just to give you kind of a quick synopsis of uh, these four books, and then we'll vote, not with the poll, but with the chat box, uh, when we're done to decide which book we will read for next next months. Yeah, and I'll um, start before Jenna jumps in too by saying that um, I will say that a lot of the books in the cli-fi genre tend to be very post-apocalyptic and, and dark. Um, and there is some um, really interesting discussion, I think, around that. There was a great commentary from an environmental education scholar, David Sobel, a couple of years ago that talked about how he's always really resisted this genre, um, but that students actually are feeling this angst right now. And so when they read this, they feel recognized that there is some angst in the world. And oftentimes these books have heroes um, and um, kind of something to work towards. So, you know, the classic one for all of us, Hunger Games, probably most people know that story. You've got this strong female character that ends up being sort of a hero of things. And so, although, I think a lot of us maybe feel like a lot of it is dark. We have some more hopeful ones in this one we've selected. Um, and some of them aren't traditional cli-fi per se too. Some of them are nonfiction related, but um, I think this darkness is something that really resonates with students um, and how they are actually feeling. I know I feel that way a little bit of darkness too sometimes. So um, it's it, that would be, I think, something really interesting to talk about as a group too, how uh, we feel about these reading these with students so anyways jenna all right exodus uh is the first one uh, we put page numbers on these um just for you know for you to see how long these are um but definitely a young, young adult fiction book um set about 100 years i guess a little less than 100 years from now um this was written uh, just for your reference in 2002, but when I read this um, this past year, it really felt like it could have been written this year. Um, there was a lot of themes that connected to how things were progressing politically in this country, um, but then also obviously some climate change themes in here as well. So it tells the story um, of the island of Wing, um, which is about to be flooded by rising seas um, and really sea level rise around the world has uh, increased dramatically, I think, beyond anything that we've really talked about. So it would be a, a great opportunity, too, to talk um, kind of about the science and how scientifically correct some of the information is in this book, um, but is, um, again, a strong female lead 
um, 15 year old. So at middle school, early high school age, um, you know, students are really able to relate to this um, and really about the survival of, of Mara and her, her family and her community on this island, how they're going to be able to survive in this um, completely changing world. So we read it this year. We worked with a school out in Washington, D.C. to completely change their sixth grade humanities curriculum to be climate change centric. And this was one of the books that they're adding to their curriculum. So Exodus is one option for us. Second one, um, I'll talk about a same sun here. Um, the really interesting thing about this particular book, it's all written in letters. So it's a snail mail pen pal situation um, between Mina and River. Um, Mina is an Indian immigrant girl living in New York City's Chinatown and River is a Kentucky coal miner's son and they find uh, very unique similarities between their situations even though they're um, you know would be maybe unlikely friends um, and find a lot that they have in common um, between each other and again there's a lot of themes in this book as well uh, of, of how things are progressing um, in this uh, country and one thing that we found really interesting in this book, um, I guess this was another book that, that the school out in Washington, D.C. is adding to their curriculum, um, is how uh, students and, and kids aren't, are, are able to ask the questions of each other that maybe adults can't ask. Um, you know, they ask cultural related questions just because they're curious about things. So it's, you're able to really talk about a lot of cultural differences um, between students um, in a very respectful um, and, and an open way. So the main goal, the main theme in here is, is talking about mountaintop removal, um, uh, which is uh, a big thing in the East, in Kentucky, in that area. And that was one of the reasons why this school in, in Washington, D.C. chose this book, um, because that's something that's happening in Maryland as well. Um, so again, uh, all written in letters, which is just a really fun way to read a book. All right, I'm in charge of the next two and I feel completely outdone by Jenna's book, <laughs> book club <laughs> descriptions, but um, Shipbreaker. Um, this is another book um, that I think is a really interesting um, example of how you read some of these books that seem so out there and futuristic and then you learn how actually things like this are happening like right now. And so in this particular case, this is again in the future, um, oil tankers are being broken down for parts in a very flooded world that's been recently beach, reached by a, a hurricane. Um, and, um, and, you know, a part of the, the, the people that sort of remain are, are held in more of a slave-like way. Um, and then there's the rich and the wealthy that are um, surviving thriving, I would say, in, in a different part. Um, and this particular profession, you're, I read this and I was like, whoa, this is gross. Like, what is this shipbreaker idea? What, what, like, it just seems so foreign to me, but this is actually happening off the coast of Africa. Um, this is an actual thing, shipbreakers. And, um, and so there's, once again, grounded in a reality where you, um, you actually learn about something that, that's happening in the world and also kind of identify with what you might call the other, um, learning about someone that's totally different. So that's Shipbreaker, and Jenna had 326 pages. Um, all of these so far are available in paperback also. Um, and then finally, this is not Cli-Fi, this is our um, nonfiction hopeful book, which um, this just came out three or four months ago um, from Paul Hawken. Um, and I don't know, Jen, if you want to open, you have it with you, open it up to a page. So it's a, be it's a beautiful book to start out. Um, and what it is, is Paul Hawken, along with a huge team of researchers um, and scientists, um, developed through modeling of um, different scenarios, 100 solutions that they um, can show would have a major impact on climate change um, um, and carbon pollution. And they show how much they cost, they show how much carbon is reduced um, by, by doing them, and they have them organized into different, um, I like different themes or categories. Um, and one of the things that I identify, oh, you're showing it, you knew I was gonna say this. So, <laughs> 
Um, what number is it? It's number six, isn't it? So it's like ranked in, in order of what is most effective. And um, number six out of 100 is educating girls um, as, a, as one of the major solutions. Um, and so um, it's really cool. It isn't necessarily a book that you would have to read, um, but um, it has some lovely examples and case studies in it and you could kind of bounce around in as well. So um, those are our choices. Now, we were planning, if we don't choose, of course you can do whatever you want, your adults, but <laughs> we're gonna choose one that we're gonna discuss specifically next month, but we'll recycle them too, especially if people say, oh, I really wanna make sure that one comes back around again as a chance. We have a ton of other books and I'm sure some of you, we're hoping you all will um, suggest them too, if you run into them or you're looking for them. Um, Devardi was reminding us, places to look for them. So one good place is if you use Goodreads, there's a Cli-Fi category in there. Um, I think Amazon designates them as well. So you can find kind of book lists. So with that, in the chat box, if you don't mind, um, voting on the book that you would want to dedicate some time to reading for next month's meeting. Um, and then we'll take, we'll count it up. And if you want to message us um, privately. privately, you can do that too. That's true. <laughs> like That's any true. one of us um, and message us. We're gonna have like a split or something totally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course, one of each. So. <laughs> Just three votes. No one else is gonna vote. So we have two for Exodus if we take one of them. Three, we got another one coming in. Did everyone vote? Did Betsy vote? Looks like Kristen went offline. We lost her. Oh. There you are. There you are. Yay. Great. Well, great. So it's five minutes to recognizing the time is ahead. Um, does anyone, do you want to introduce this end bit, um, Jenna, before we head off into the great sunset? Yeah, um, so this volunteer opportunity to write a reflection blog for us. Um, so really we're looking at what did you think of the book and then how will you use it with your students um, or teachers that you work with um, and questions to answer for pretty straightforward. Um, how did it work as a story? How did it work scientifically? Um, that's a big piece with Exodus. Uh, how would you use it with your students and then educational or scientific resor resources you use to integrate? So are there additional articles you can pair with it or graphs that you can use um, kind of supplementally to kind of stretch this out and really make this um, not only a novel, but, you know, a, a scientific or social science lesson. So if you're interested, you can message me um, and let me know um, right now, or you wanna think about it, um, I'll email out some resources and things that we talked about today, and you can reply back to that if you're interested in, in doing that. Yep. Does anyone have, so feel free to message, does anyone have any questions or comments or anything at this point that they wanna um, share before we sign off for the evening?
We're really, yeah, we really appreciate you all taking an hour of your time and joining us today too. And we'd love to have you back. But like I said, this is the No Guilt Network. But we'd love to have you come back if you can't make it next month. Because Exodus is going to be awesome discussion. You do not want to miss it. And we'll be um, sending this out to all the folks that signed up. We had probably 40 folks sign up so far for the network. And we, as this is actually 25%, which is higher than I usually would expect to show up. <laughs> but <laughs> Great. And we will be posting the recordings from these. So yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. everyone have a great evening and enjoy reading Exodus and we'll be in touch. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.